ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of the 33 Fuel vlog. My name is Warren, I'm one of the co-founders here at 33 Fuel, and today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Brian Keane. Brian is a bit of a fitness legend, and I first met him a couple of years ago at the Marathon de Saab seminar. Uh, I've been presenting a talk there on the five things no one tells you about the MDS. Um, if you're interested in that, then I'll stick a link uh, down to the presentation at the, the bottom of the show notes here. But I met Brian there, and you may think from this, well, obviously he's into his fitness, uh, and he's running the Marathon de Saab, so he's all about the running. Well, at that point, and currently, Brian is all about the running but it's his background that makes him incredibly interesting and incredibly useful to all of us looking to raise our performance. Why is this? This is because Brian's back sporting background starts with Gaelic football, a unique Irish hybrid sport which can brings together rugby, um, Aussie rules football and basketball and kind of mashes them all together in this unique sport. Um, it's very fast, it's very physical, it's a great game. Uh, we'll be diving into a little bit about that, so you'll, you'll learn a bit about that sport with Brian. But he then transitioned from this into bodybuilding and fitness modeling. Um, so it was all about the muscle gain, manipulating fat loss, creating certain body compositions and shapes through nutrition and training. He did that very intensely, competed on the world stage, and then he swapped into ultra endurance events. What this gives Brian is an incredibly broad scope and by the way, he's very good at teaching and bringing the message across because, handily enough, in amongst all this, he spent four years as a teacher. Um, and so what we're able to get from Brian is this amazing resource, this toolkit that really allows um, endurance athletes, aerobic athletes, uh, those of us who are focused on our cycling, our swimming, our running, our triathlon, to give us an entry point into the world of strength work for endurance and aerobic performance. Because let's face it, it's something a lot of us will overlook. It's often easier, peculiarly, to go for like a five hour bike ride or a two hour run than it is to actually go and pick up some weights. Because often as endurance athletes or aerobic athletes, we don't really know where to begin. Um, Brian is gonna unlock all of that. And also there's good reason to do this. If you can incorporate strength, as he puts it, this is, if you're not doing it, it's money you're leaving on the table. It's a gain that's waiting there to be picked up. It can make you faster, it can make you more injury resistant, it can simply make you enjoy your sport more. So, enough from me. I mean, this is what it's all about for us here at 33, is sharing this kind of knowledge, because all we're about is making athletes fitter, happier, healthier, and faster. And we do it in two ways. We do it by sharing great content like this we got coming up with Brian, and we do it in store with our incredible natural sports nutrition products at 33fuel. Dot com. So, intro out of the way, it's a great honor and a pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Brian Keane. Brian Keane, welcome to the show. Thank you after an epic endurance event, we actually got together and to do this. We did. It's been a long time coming. We were just saying before we went on air, Warren, we've been like like two years in the making to get this done. So I'm absolutely delighted to be on. Thanks so much for having me. No, likewise. Thank you for coming on. It's good to see you again. Where do we find you today? Whereabouts are you? In which part of the world are you in? So I'm out literally at home in the west of Ireland. I couldn't be further west as in the middle of the country. Like as, like, as we're recording, there's literally a sheep outside of my window eating the grass in my lawn. So that kind of gives you a visual of where I am right now. That, that's beautiful. And I like the organic approach to lawn management that you're taking there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it works you know you got to do what you can in 2019 <laughs> too right too right keep keep them fed who knows what's going to happen with brexit and everything else you might need to be uh, exporting a few of those sheep over here pretty soon <laughs> well i'll trade you some 33 shake we, we will do some uh, chia seed gels and i'll trade you some sheep for it <laughs> hey, look, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do barter might become the new currency we could be onto something there brian i don't know how we'll get it through the online channels but for you we'll make it happen we'll figure it out we we, we got this one <laughs> A hey, nice one. Now look, some of the stuff, I mean, there's tons that, that we could go into here, you know, through your background, your experience. I mean, the place that I really want to get us to is really working on some very actionable strength, conditioning, muscle, physical work for aerobic endurance athletes, because it's such an overlooked element. It's somewhere where people can really gain. But I think before that, we should do a little bit of an intro because, I mean, I'll, I'll have teed this up already in the intro. People will have known who you are, why, why we should be here. But 
Gaelic football. That's your background, right? Now, that is not a uh, globally well-known sport. I did a little bit of uh, research. Even Gaelic football's own organization, they introduced the sport as a distinctly Irish field invasion game. Now, <laughs> I love that as a description of any sport. Part rugby, part football, um, part basketball, uh, part yeah. everything. I mean, just... Can you give us a potted intro to that? Because you played from the age of six. That was your kind of sporting gateway, right? Tell us a bit more. Yeah, so I played that. Like, I've had a ball in my hand since I could walk. Um, and the beauty of Gaelic football is it's all of those sports, as you said, combined. So it kind of gives you, like... One of the things that anyone that's ever played Gaelic football has been good with is going into any other sport. Like you can go into soccer, you can go into rugby, you can go into basketball, and you've got so many skills that you've learned through this one sport that translates into all these other sports. Um, so you tend to get a lot of Irish people who can kind of turn their hand at a lot of those other sports because of it. Um, but yeah, I played all my life up until most of my adult life, until the age of 26. I played all the way through, you know, even when I was living in London, I spent four years living in London working full time as a teacher. I played football over there and then I played at my club. I used to fly back for the championship games um, and I would literally be doing that weekend warrior job where I'd fly out from Gatwick on a, on a Friday and fly back again on a Sunday and then go back to school to work on Monday um, but yeah I played that for most of my life a little bit of a different background compared to what I'm doing now with the ultra endurance events like it doesn't really prepare you for that um, but it's a great sport that you know I've got some of my best friends that I've been playing with since I was six I'm still friends with them now um, and it's just it's that element that I love and even though it's a very Irish sport it's huge in London and it's huge in the US within the Irish communities that live over there. Um, so it's something that I played when I lived in California. It's something that I played when I lived in London. Um, and it's something that I've kind of played all the way through until probably the age of 26, 27. Good, good going. I mean, I, I had a quick look at the rules and this is not a podcast about Gaelic football, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> the one that freaked me out is you cannot take, I, I, forgive me if I've got this not quite right. You cannot take more than four steps without bouncing or kicking the ball. but So that's a little bit like basketball. Um, but then you've got the kicking element. I saw players kicking it back into their hands. But it seems like you could keep running with the ball in multiples of four steps as long as you interspersed each four steps with a kick of the ball or a bounce of it. But you can't do both simultaneously. How, is that right? And if so, how do you get your head around learning that to start with? Because to have that on autopilot while you're navigating a game is quite a skill. It is and it isn't. It's very similar to basketball in the sense that, you know, dribbling a bas basketball, it's the same idea, except that when instead of being able to do that consistently, you have to be able to do what, what's called a solo. It's where you kick the ball from your foot back up to your hand. Um, and when you're playing it from an early age, it just kind of becomes automatic. It's just it's the form of dribbling in that sport. Um, also, it, Gaelic football is a full contact sport. So you're not going the length of the field with the ball before someone hits you and tackles you. So you can be kind of safe enough in that assumption that uh, that's not going to happen. You're going to get clocked pretty quickly if you do that. <laughs> No, so I'm, I'm glad I at least un understood the basics of it. So look, let's, let's go from Gaelic football because I like in your journey, we've got Gaelic football, which is a tough, complicated, hardcore Irish sport that goes to a very high level. You've, you've, you've come from that. But then we, we're also going to throw in teacher in there. So we're going to come to London and be a teacher for a bit. Then we're also going to throw in fitness modeling on the west coast of America. And we're also going to throw in a very strong business that you built, certainly initially, off the back of body transformation, whether fat reduction, muscle growth, whatever it may be. At that point, you know, you've gone from a very hard sport into something that potentially could be, with via teaching, something that could be like the only way is Essex. It's all about muscles and body composition. But I know you've done it, to, uh, you know, you've done it with a focus on purpose. But then you're going yeah. through this journey and you're throwing ultra endurance into the mix. It's a real very broad and often some would say conflicting manner of skills that you've put together. Um, how have you found that journey flipping between the two, uh, well, flipping between all those different areas? And how does that inform what you do now? It gives you quite a unique perspective. I think that I'm very fortunate in the sense that I have such a wide perspective when it comes to fitness and training, even qualifications through strength and conditioning and sports nutrition, all of that. 
and going into different sports and into different fields and into different types of training. So like the world of competitive bodybuilding, which I did in fitness modeling compared to GEA playing high level sport. I did CrossFit when I used to live in London as well. And then I went into the world of ultra endurance and now I run ultra marathons and do triathlon. And because I've done it all, or I've done those core disciplines, I'm able to offer a perspective on what works. So I generally Really cross pollinate a lot of ideas. So when it comes to say the strength and conditioning element, there's parts of the GA strength and conditioning that is amazingly beneficial for ultra endurance runners. Now there's other parts that aren't applicable at all. Like you're not going to be doing the sprint based work, the glute activation work as much. You're going to be doing more biomechanical work to make sure that your physical structure is strong so that you don't break down after a hundred kilometer run. But there's a lot of kind of cross ideas there. And the same with I initially when I started to compete in bodybuilding and fitness modeling, I had to learn a lot about the, the dietary way of fueling the body. So I started to learn a lot about, you know, fat adaption versus carb adaption when I was in the, the idea of trying to reduce my body fat so I could step on stage or before a photo shoot. But what I also found when I did that was that my cardio and endurance and actual aerobic system would change based on the food that I was eating at the time. Um, so if I was doing more fat adapted style eating, I found that I, my aerobic output was so much better when I was trying to reduce body fat. And it, then you just start naturally asking those questions. You're like, OK, why am I fitter or why do I feel more fueled when I technically have less calories? But then you start to learn about fat adaption. You're like, OK, when I went into the world of ultra endurance then and marathon to sob and running through the arctic and a lot of these different things i took those ideas and i just kind of fleshed them out and you're using yourself as an experiment you know i do it with clients and people i work with as well but you're always using yourself as an experiment but you're taking the ideas training nutrition and supplementation that's where i came across you know the 33 shake and your stuff like I remember having this conversation with you at the Marathon to Saab seminar. I'm like, I was literally going out to Marathon to Saab and I wasn't going taking any supplements with me. I'm like, I can't find ones that don't wreck my gut. I can't find ones that don't make me feel sick. And then I came across years and I'm like, okay. And then this is all, that's all I use now on the ultra endurance events. And so you're, you're kind of playing around with different disciplines when it comes to what you learned in one to make you better in the other. So I've been very fortunate in that element. Now the business and the teaching is nearly a whole other side you know I went in and worked as a primary school teacher for four years that's what I did in London I qualified as a teacher in London I worked in I studied in St. Mary's University in Twickenham and then I went on and was working as a teacher for four years but two of those years I was working as a personal trainer and then when I decided that that I was going to try this fitness thing full time back in 2014 when I moved back to Ireland I needed something that would kind of separate me from other trainers and at the time there wasn't a lot of people competing and I was getting a lot of these opportunities thrown my way in terms of competitions and photo shoots and magazine stuff and website for like men's health magazine the the websites and all these different people that were connecting to me for workouts and I'm like okay this could actually differentiate me because no one knows who I am I have no social media platform I have no online presence I'm like this might help me get my personal training business off the ground so I went into that route and the natural progression for that was okay you should step on stage and the natural progression to that then was you know you travel to the US and you do your photo shoots and you do the worlds in terms of the fitness model world championships I did that in 2015 I came eighth in that in the world championships that was my last show and then I transitioned out I wrote my first book the year after and then kind of went into the world of ultra endurance when I needed a new challenge um, and again the why I do ultra endurance events is completely different to what I, I did fitness modeling and competitive bodybuilding like the ultra endurance stuff is all personal in terms of the development that I get and the consistent like smashing through any mental limitations that you have because as someone that comes from that background of say GEA initially where the most you're ever going for is like 60 70 minutes like you know there's a big difference between that and trying to run 24 24 hours in an ultra marathon like they're worlds apart and I just didn't believe a lot of the physical things were possible until I started to hear about these events like Marathon de Saab or you know in February this year when I ran through the Arctic you know lots of different things that just make me question all my belief systems and all my limitations so I do it for a completely different reason um, 
Um, and then the strength and conditioning, the sports nutrition and the supplementation, all of that is just kind of molded. Like I've been training my entire adult life and I've been transitioning from one sport to the other and into different areas because I just, you know, I get bored. <laughs> like I get bored of doing one thing all the time. And I'm very fortunate in the sense that I can pull from different avenues. And then I, all we're doing now is kind of fleshing it out on podcasts. I do it on my own podcast and trying to share ideas and get people thinking about, you know, just because you run ultra marathons doesn't mean that this system over here that bodybuilders use won't benefit you. Or just because you're a bodybuilder or a GA player, this fat adaption or this supplement from the world of ultra endurance will benefit you as well. You know, like I've recommended your chia seed, the gel to football players to take at half time, the ones with sensitive stomachs. I'm like, you should take this. I'm like the pink Himalayan salt, the chia seeds. I'm like, it's just going to give you a steady release of energy. I was like, if you have a sensitive gut like me, you should try that. And they're not, inter- they're not endurance athletes. They're GA players. But I know that it works for similar ways and similar people. And then all you're doing is as a coach and a trainer is being like, well, this is what you should consider. This is what you should try. And then you double down on what works and you cut what doesn't. I mean, that's, that's a brilliant fleshing out of the picture there. And it, it makes huge sense when you put it out like that, because by going through all these different worlds at a serious and high level, you come out with a much broader view and you're able to cross pollinate between the worlds because you're right. I mean, just take our products as an example, they're focused on an endurance market, but to be honest, they have a huge application beyond that. It's just where we come from. That's why we started making them. You know, you're throwing up on that many ultra marathons, you're like, something has to give. Yeah. You've got that breadth of experience that you then take to other places. Leads me to a question though. A lot of people say, for example, fitness modeling, right? Which if anyone who's not familiar with that world, there are different categories within the world of bodybuilding um, to the outsider, it's the same thing as bodybuilding, right? It's posing on a stage, yeah. judges are yeah. going to judge your physique, you're going to do a set routine of poses they ask for, then you've got your own routine to highlight your strengths. Same, same, same sort of gift? That's it. In a nutshell, like you couldn't have explained it better. <laughs> hey, is it, well, I, I went to the World Championship of Bodybuilding several years ago. Um, one of the most entertaining stories I ever did as a journalist because not only were the characters extreme, the audience was extreme. I mean, the audience is as interesting as, as the stage at a show like that, but that, yeah. that's a story for another day. But okay, so that kind of thing for many people is a pinnacle goal, right? And that can become their life. That can become their defining thing. You know, oh, this is Brian. He's a bodybuilder. He's a fitness model. You achieved that, but you then moved on to do something else. Not only that, you moved to the world of endurance, which let's face it, even though you're still able to keep in shape and you know, you're gonna get much fitter in other ways. You're not gonna maintain that peak, peak physique that you had on that day. So you have to turn your back on an old goal in order to achieve a new one. Makes perfect sense, but many people struggle to let go of something once they've achieved it. How have you found that journey? I mean, is that relevant to what you've gone through? Yeah, in the sense that, yeah, 100%, like it's an amazing point. And I was fortunate because for, for a couple of reasons. One, my daughter was born in 2015. She was born in May 2015. And I did the Worlds in August 2015. And the world of competitive bodybuilding, as extreme as it is, and the world of ultra endurance, and extreme as that world is, competitive bodybuilding was worse for me because there's no switch off. And there's a lot of, like, it's funny you talk about, like, extreme bodybuilders in the audience. Like, and I I see so much crossover with the world of ultra endurance. Like, it's unbelievable believable the extreme on both sides they're, they're different goals bodybuilders are extreme in terms of composition and physique ultra endurance athletes are insane in, in, in terms of what they want to do with their physical body and their mind but it's very similar in this crossover but for me the world of competitive bodybuilding and fitness modeling and i was traveling a lot as well because i was doing photo shoots all over i was traveling quite a bit and i made the decision when my daughter was born this was going to be my last show so it was several months after and i'd already committed to doing the worlds in las vegas and that was it. I'm like, that's going to be my last show. So I did that show and, and I left it behind me. You know, it, I had reached what I wanted to reach. Like my world was based on how can I expand my, my profile? How can I use it to pro- build my business and build my name and reputation? And I got that from it. I got that in before the world's in 2015. And that was kind of my pinnacle point at that where I was at. And then after that, to be honest, Warren, I took a break with the exception of training, which I did, 
I went in and did high intensity workouts. I did circuit training. I did weight training. But for the space of about 18 months, I didn't do anything. You know, I focused on writing my first book. I focused on building the business. I started the podcast and I started a lot more putting a lot more attention on my business. And then when I heard about Marathon de Saab, which was my first ultra endurance event, like I signed up to my first marathon in the January of 2018 to prepare for for marathon to solve in april 2018 like so i'd never done a marathon i'd never ran and i literally was like right i better do a marathon before i go to the sahara so i signed up for the one in dubai and i ran that in january which was like three or four months before and then i went and did marathon to solve and that planted that seed because that world was so extreme and there's a little bit of self-awareness on my part as well i have to be excited about the goal that i set for myself like i wouldn't train for a marathon like i know myself there was no way i couldn't say i'm going to do a marathon and i train i'm like if i'm going to do a marathon i'm going to do a marathon to stop i'm like if i'm going to do an ultra i'm going to run through the arctic you know it's like if i'm doing a tri- triathlon i'm going to move into iron man like i have to have it as extreme because otherwise i won't train for it i just can't get the motivation to train And to bridge those and make that transition from one to the other, I got similar things. When I was competing in bodybuilding and trying to climb the world as a fitness model, I was constantly trying to push and push and push and see how far I could go. And when I left that world, I needed to get that same feeling from something else. And ultra endurance was the only thing that gave it to me. So the transition was quite easy. I wasn't leaving one thing behind to go into something else because I was getting a very similar feeling and a very similar fulfillment level from both. It was just that it was in a completely different realm. Like when I tell people that, they're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. From the outside, it looks nuts because the worlds are so far apart. But I'm like, they're kind of the same. I'm like, it's kind of the same what you want to do. You're just channeling your energy and your focus in completely different ways. No, that, that's, that's a brilliant point. And I, I think it's that, that linking thread. You know, it's something extreme. It's something that pushes you. It's something that takes you to a place mentally and physically you've not been before. It, it stretches you. But I think some people people can become almost comfortable. Once you specialize in something, you're an expert, you're at the top of your game. Um, it can be hard to, to move on from that, particularly, and it's a subject of a whole, whole different podcast, but when you assume that external thing you do as part of an internal identity, then you know that change becomes harder. And for you, that thread remained, and that's allowed you to have a much broader journey. And I mean, I can certainly resonate with that because previously, we go back some time now, I used to race motorcycles. And I have two friends who I used to race with. And we all now enjoy trail running, ultra running, cycling, that sort of thing. And we discuss the same that you've said, we get a sense of release and flow. Like you're focused on one thing, it takes you to a place. Motorcycle racing forces you into one place. Literally, you're closed off in a helmet, you can't think about anything else, you're in the moment. But it's only 20 minutes, half an hour. Actually, ultra running, can give you that same switch off, space, headspace, moment, stretch, pause, whatever you like, a very different way. And uh, I have to say, um, certainly as I get a little older, um, I'm very keen that it doesn't come with the risk of either getting run over or breaking my legs, which is really nice. That's an added benefit. (laughs) But your journey, taking you into that ultra space, okay, you mentioned very short lead up to the Marathon de Saab, and most people I know will be familiar with it. For anyone who's not, uh, 156 miles through the Sahara Desert, six days or five, I forget. Uh, six days, yeah. Six days, um, carrying all of your kit. They will give you seven liters of water a day. Anything else, if it's not on your back, that includes your daily food, your sleeping bag, the lot. If it's not on your back on the start line, you don't see it again till the finish, right? That's it, exactly. Running, running through the Sahara, kipping under a sort of blanket tent with, with seven other blokes or, or, or women every night. Um, a big challenge, a huge running challenge, uh, very hot, very sandy, very bloody difficult. You went into that, so January is your first marathon distance run. April, you're out to run the Sahara. That is a very, very punchy timeline. And I think it might relate to what we were going to focus on in the podcast because you've got a fitness background that helps you focus your training. But do you think your strength and conditioning background gave you literally the chassis on which you were able to build that endurance and and actually succeed in that run? I think maybe even to focus it more, if you didn't have that strength and conditioning background, do you think you'd have been able to go 
into such a big endurance event so quickly? Uh, no, I think that my background and a combination of my physical training background mixed in with my knowledge, because obviously a qualified strength and conditioning coach, qualified sports nutritionist, that's my background. And that all led into the quick turnover. Now, there was actually one third thing that I'll add on to that in terms of an element, and then I'll expand on the three. And I actually work better within that shorter timeline as well. You know, I can't set a goal for two to a year from now. I can't set a goal for 18 months from now. It needs to be in the foreseeable future. So January, February, March, April, that three-month period beforehand, like I went tunnel vision with focus. I went tunnel vision with my nutrition, and I was all geared in towards it. So to give you an idea on what I did in terms of my training that get, give a little bit of background, my – I switched over completely on my training to condition myself for marathon to sob. So when I signed up, I signed up for it in, oh man, Warren, when I, I signed up for an August of 2017, so a few months beforehand, and I did my first run in what was definitely about two years. So in GA, you don't really do long runs. You do a lot of sprints. Like it's, you know, for anyone that's unfamiliar with the way I look, like I'm built for speed and power. You know, I, I'm short. I'm five foot eight. I'm built like a hobbit. Like, you know, I'm not built for endurance. But, by any let's strength. say you're, you're carrying a little bit more muscle than your average hobbit, you know. Yeah. Bil <laughs> yeah Bilbo, well, Bilbo Baggins, up. I think you'd have him in an arm wrestle. Yeah, yeah, Bilbo on bench press. But that that was what I did training wise in the lead up. And I did my first two kilometer run that day. I signed up for marathon to stop, and I nearly got sick. And I remember thinking, "Oh my god, what am I after signing up for?" Like it was a real baptism of fire because I'm like, I'm not going to get tired till 10 kilometers. And I did two, and I felt I was going to get sick. But that built really quickly. Like I went from two to three kilometers so I was doing my full workouts first and then I was doing my runs at the end of them which is what I still do to this day and I was doing two kilometer runs at the end then I went to three then I went to five when I went from five to ten kilometers and then I went where I was doing 20 kilometer runs consistently at the end of my workouts and then I would taper that up and down and then I did obviously the marathon in January which brought me in to the um, marathon to sob but the thing is with marathon to sob and this is what I was trying to tell people it's actually, I won't say it's easier because the conditions are horrific. Like that, to actually run through the Sahara is very, very difficult in terms of the terrain and um, the recovery elements really low. But if you're physically strong, I was very, very lucky, Warren, in the sense that like my backpack, because it was full of food. All I had with me was the 33 shake stuff and food. Like I had oats with me. I had nuts with me. I had protein powder with me. And then I had your chia seed gels and your shakes. That's all I had with me. So my backpack weighed nearly twice as much as everybody else. But I could carry that. Like I was training with, I was doing those 20 kilometer runs with 20 kilo plates in my backpack. Which is and something that most I, people would not be able to do. Like most runners are advised, do not run with your pack because you're going to get injured. You've built a frame that can easily handle that weight. They're good advantage. Easy. Like it, it, that, I didn't struggle once with the weight on my bag um, at any stage during training or during the event. You know, I, 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 there's different ups and downsides. You know, I'm not super fast. You know, I, I don't have the same speed as other people who are lighter, you know, but I'm also in a very fortunate position that I don't have to eat that often during things like marathon to sob because I have a lot of muscle. I'm able to store muscle glycogen way more effectively than a skinnier guy. You know, like I'm still, I'm 85 kilos, five foot eight. You know, I'm able to, to hold a lot of glycogen, muscle carbohydrate, store glycogen. And that fuels me during, like I can run a whole marathon, a whole 50 kilometers, 60 kilometers and not eat anything. I can do that fasted as long as I've eaten the day before. That can I can do that. My body will do it. I don't because it's not the most effective strategy, but I've tried it and tested it and I can. But that's all down to my background. So everyone has pros and cons. You know, other people who are skinnier are going to be faster, but they're going to have to take on more food or gels, etc. as they're doing it. So I was lucky in that sense. So you have that. When it comes to oh when it comes to using the strength and conditioning background, one of the advantages that I had that a lot of other runners didn't in the Sahara was my biomechanics never break down when I run. Like my form very rarely breaks down because I've got a lot of core strength from the work that I've done in the gym. So up to this day, 
you know, I'm training now for a hundred mile ultra in February and I still do my workouts first. So I always do my gym workouts in the morning, 30, 40 minutes. Sometimes they're an hour and then I do my runs after. So that all, that means when I actually go and step out and do an ultra marathon, I don't really fatigue that quickly because I'm already being used to working in a state of pre-fatigue. Something that I also did at my legs was well, I used to hammer my legs with squats and lunges and then run 20 kilometers. And that used to, when I actually went out then to do normal training run, you feel way lighter because you've built up this ridiculous endurance in your legs. So you can use it to your advantage. So there's a lot of misconceptions that people have, but if you train the right way and you design your gym based workout or, you know, a core based workout, that's all going to enhance your performance, particularly in ultra running. You know, there's different endurance sports, of course, triathletes, etc. But particularly for the world of ultra running, that's going to have massive benefit and crossover. Um, and I put a lot of the reason down to my quick turnover of training to being able to run Marathon de Saab through having that background. I'm like, if I didn't have that, I would, I probably be physically wouldn't have been able my body wouldn't have been conditioned enough but i had enough strength built up and i kept that training right up and then i tapered off right before marathon to sob and thankfully like you know there's a million things that could go wrong in the sahara but thankfully it all went okay and i got through it no that, that that's beautiful but what i also really like is the way you've kept the gym workout in there which is what i want to really get into in a minute because doing that before the run you know most people who gravitate to ultra running um, are likely to be physically closer to the archetypal runner body shape. Same in triathlon. You know, generally you're talking slimmer athletes, you're talking lighter athletes. We got you know, there's less strength, there's less of that mesomorph body, more of the ectomorph body going on, and maybe that's people just gravitating to nat natural strengths. Um, whereas by coming in from the other side, you build a very powerful argument, i.e. what is Marathon de Saab about? We need to carry weight. You've got no issue with that. What is any endurance event about? You know, and endurance is relative. If you're running your first half marathon, then you know, the first time you spend two hours running, that's endurance. You know, and then you build up. Your, your endurance level might be, well, 24 hours through the mountains. How, or it might be, even if it's triathlon, you finish on a run, and that is where you cannot hide in a triathlon. You, you know, the bike can definitely help you. Swimming, people can be a strong swimmer. But if you're not in the right condition, that run's going to hurt you because that's where the biomechanics break down. That's where the run gets difficult. And suddenly, you're working twice as hard to generate the same forward motion because you can't maintain that form. You also get a much bigger injury risk. Whereas everything you put in place, we come back to that chassis of like a Formula One car, you've got this incredibly strong chassis in there which is something that is overlooked by a lot of people who focus on aerobic sports, they also can worry that, well, I don't want to, you know, I'm going quite well at the moment. I don't want to put on bulk. I don't want to get heavier. What about my power to weight? What about aerodynamics on the bike? Um, they don't see the benefit. Well, maybe I could store a bit more muscle glycogen, which is going to help. You know, you've got fat adaption boosting your fat ability, but why not store a little bit more glycogen as well? Let's take a bit more of that round with us. Um, Look at holding your form. Look at your injury reduction. Look at your recovery times. I think you know there's a huge gain for anyone involved in any aerobic distance sport in doing more work in the gym. But if you are someone who really is focused on aerobic and endurance sports, the gym isn't necessarily a comfortable place. It's not a known place. It can be easier. And I, you know, I've experienced this and I know it's common. Um, it can be easier to go, I'll do a four hour run today than I'll go and do 45 minutes lifting weights because you just don't know where to begin. So those four hour runs keep coming on. Now, actually, there comes a point where you're really only building fractional amounts of endurance. If you could put that focus into core, muscle, strength, even explosive power, you could really raise your game again and become a better athlete, which is, you know, what sort of, that's what I really want to get into here now is, from your point of view, what are the best ways that someone can begin to build strength? And you know, if they want a bit of extra physique in there as well, maybe have a bit of that. But in order to make themselves a better, longer lasting, faster, more sustainable distance athlete, whether I say it's half marathon or Ironman or, or uh, ultra marathon, discuss. So I'm going to take one step backwards before I kind of talk about what are some best practices that people can apply. And that is like the basic pyramid of prioritization principle. 
people. Like if somebody comes and asks me about training for a half marathon or a marathon or an ultra marathon, whatever it is, the basic pyramid of prioritization is yes, you need to be able to cover the mileage. So there's th that part of that argument where I wouldn't tell somebody to go and do a gym program if they can't even cover 10 kilometers and they want to run, you know, a full marathon. I'm like, right, you should prioritize your running. I'm like, that's what you should do in your training. But the people that are looking to move to the next level, who are already covered the mileage, who are like, because as you, you as you said, going from a four hour run to a five hour run or 10, 20 kilometers to 30 or 30 to 40 or 40 to 50 comfortably, they're, they're marginal gains by just being out on the road. Like you might improve your time slightly by doing more running, but like you hit this wall, like you're going to hit that, the, the, the uh, just a physical wall. It's, it needs the improvement needs to come from another angle. The improvement is going to come from improving your biomechanics. The improvement in speed is going to come from bracing your core so that you don't break down when you get fatigued. The improvement is going to come from building up the muscular endurance in your legs. All of these things are actually going to physically improve your duration, your time on your feet in terms of how fast you can go at a certain speed compared to just constantly pounding the ground and pounding the pavement thinking that that's going to bring you up now as i said pyramid of prioritization if you need to be able to cover that mileage first but just just so we're clear on that so i don't want because every once in a while some people are like yeah we'll do the gym work i'm like but look this is for you need to be able to cover the mileage first and foremost and then everything else is going to bring you up as an athlete in general so what i tend to focus on again it generally comes down to whatever the weakness is like you're always going to reverse engineer the athlete like wherever you were weak and i didn't define where you're weak and where your run breaks down or where your discipline breaks down you know it's basic triathlon the reason i love triathlon as an example is which one are you weak at that's the one you should spend more time on particularly if it's the bike because it's such a huge portion of the tri triathlon you know so if you're weak on the bike you should do more things either gym based work or bike based work that improves your discipline in that area and triathlon is great because you can be the best swimmer in the world you can be the best person on the bike but if you can't run you should be putting time and energy into improving your run and that's how your basic body is in terms of an ultra marathon if you're finding that your legs are completely fatiguing and building up a lactic acid and you just can't clear that and your muscular fatigue is killing you 20 kilometers into a 30 kilometer race or 30 kilometers into a marathon race it's like yeah okay you need to focus on muscular endurance work in the gym so kind of high volume stuff on legs lunges presses squats variations of those movement patterns with higher volume so you might be going up into like the high rep volume you know when i was training for marathon to sub I was doing like a high volume pyramid on lunges and squats. So I did, I would do sets of 50 reps. Then I would increase the weight slightly. I would do 40 reps. I would increase it slightly 30, 20, 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And I would take a minute rest in between. So I was doing 300 reps on squats and then I would go run, you know, and that built up this really strong endurance. I'm not saying for everybody to do that, but an area that I was weak and an area I was worried about that I had identified as a potential problem before marathon to solve was my legs have never covered this distance over several days you know i ran my first marathon a few months before i had no idea what it was like to do a multi-event multi-day event and also marathon to solve on day four they come they combine it so you're doing the 86 kilometers and i'm like i've never covered that distance before i've never covered that i need to build the endurance in my legs so i identified where there was a potential weakness and i designed a gym program and designed a training regimen that would help me build on that weakness the same as if you're finding that your core is breaking down which happens with a lot of ultra runners particularly over the the longer distances 50 kilometers 60 kilometers 100 kilometers plus where core starts to break down well, you see it because people are hunched over they're literally like rounding at their shoulders because their core is completely it can't hold them up it's not able to hold them up steady as they run and as a result you run the risk of injury because if your core breaks down you're going to get a super compensatory effect elsewhere or other muscles have to kick in and they're working harder because you can't brace your core and, and keep your running form so if that's the case you would design a program around say swiss ball work so planks on a swiss ball rolling out on a swiss ball a trx where you're doing like climbing variations on a trx and building up that core strength so that is able to maintain and hold when you're out on a longer run also things like your compound lifts are going to do that your squat your deadlift your military press but they're kind of higher risk movements that they're the ones that people are like oh i'm going to add bulk i'm like look if you're covering 50 to 100 miles a week running 
you're not going to add bulk by doing three, four, ten sets of squats. Like I'm like, you're just not. You know, your body's not going to have that physical recovery. You can be eating all the calories in the world. You're not going to grow on that unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, but what will happen to people is it will build your core strength. It will build your muscular endurance. And provided you're doing it with good form and you're executing it properly and you're doing it in the right rep ranges, so maybe five to six reps with a heavier weight with perfect form, you're going to build that strength and you're going to build the baseline of someone that's able to run a longer distance without having their entire body break down because of fatigue. So again, there's lots of different answers to that based on the problem, but they're the ones that I see most often. It's normally like muscular endurance, biomechanical breakdown, or core fatigue where someone weakens and as a result, they, as you said, they run the risk, they're at a higher risk of injury because of supercompensatory effect where all the other muscles are trying to work harder just because you're not able to keep yourself up steady and keep your running form as normal that you would say on 10 kilometers, you're not able to maintain that at a hundred kilometer distance. Whereas if you do the conditioning work on top of it, there's a good chance that you're going to be able to hold at least 80 to 90% of that form that you held at 10 kilometers when you hit the 100 kilometer mark as well. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a brilliant overview. And I like that pyramid thing to kick it off. You know, if you can't run the distance, that's probably where you need to start. Now, where that can break down, for example, marathon, do you need to run a full marathon in advance? Well, probably not, but you want to be comfortable up to 15, 18 miles. You're running a hundred miler. Should you run a hundred miles in advance? No, but you should probably be comfortable at fifty. You know, um, I, I think there's the higher up the distances go, the less demand there is to necessarily knock that distance off in training. You know, you, that that's a different world. And if people are running those distances, they'll be kind of aware of where they need to be. I think it's when you get going into those first ten k's, half marathons, marathons, that first Olympic triathlon, or even uh, you know that graduation into half Ironman or full. Um, there's got to be that endurance base there. But beyond that, the ability to improve with gym work, you know, people will focus on, sure, focus on your weak point in triathlon, work your bike, it's the longest leg, whatever it may be. But the, the idea of lifting weight or, you know, gym exercises, I guess maybe it's just my perception, but things like Swiss balls, skipping ropes, um, press-ups, planks, whatever, uh, TRX, they feel a little less like weight. Weight still has this connotation with weight equals bodybuilding, and I'm a <laughs> runner, therefore I'm not doing it. Whereas the other stuff, the CrossFit's really helped. Um, I think I think expand that. But if someone were looking, and this is this will naturally have to be very broad. I think there are two parts to this question. You know, we're crossing, we're covering cycling, running, triathlon. People are looking to incorporate. Uh, some strength work. What would you say would be the three best areas to work on first? And, and just as a, a heads up, what we'd like, what I'd like to look at beyond this is if you then want to go deeper, how do you best explore that path to now get something where you're really building a program tailored to yourself? But to, before we get to that, it's like you're starting out with this. Where should you start? Let's just sort of. Can you give us sort of three good key places? to start to, to get your head around it. So there's just a point you made there, and I think this will help kind of context to my answer, where you talked about TRX and push-ups and stuff, and then weights for bodybuilders. At the end of the day, it's all resistance training. You know, that's the only, there's a misconception that weights make you big and bulky, and push-ups and pull-ups and TRX won't. I'm like, that's not necessarily true. I'm like, it's all resistance training. It's just that what weights do is they allow you to manipulate the resistance so that you fail at a given rep range. So for example, like if you're trying to build muscle, you want to be working in hypertrophy parameters. So that means that you're doing three to four sets, you know, six, uh, eight to 10 reps, 60 to 90 seconds rest. If you're doing push-ups, you're, if you're strong on push-ups, it's very unlikely you're going to fail at that rep range in those parameters with push-ups. But if you mimic that over onto a bench press, you're going to be able to fail with a heavier race. Similar movement pattern. It's working pectorials. It's working triceps. It's working front delts. It's working similar movements. It's working similar muscle groups, but it's just that you're failing at a given rep range. So it the end of the day it comes back to resistance all your body your body doesn't understand the difference between body weight 
and weight training. All it understands is the difference between the resistance and what the weights allow you to do is to manipulate that resistance so that you can build muscle and work for hypertrophy if that's the goal. Um, you can work for endurance if you want to do body weight and do 50 or 100 push-ups, break it up and rest pause it. It's just working in different resistance in that aerobic or in that endurance zone. So just to kind of give context to that, that misconception is, well, is what people have, particularly a lot of ultra athletes and people doing aerobic style workouts to not confuse that. So when it comes to that principle and then bringing what you can do into the gym, it kind of comes back to what I mentioned earlier about where you're weak. Now, there's a couple of best practices. So when it comes to a best practice that the majority of people listening could apply straight away and it would benefit them is focusing a program around compound lifts. Like that's always going to be a good bread and butter way to get a good return on in your investment in terms of physical performance for not a lot of time, energy, and effort. So your compound lifts are your basic deadlift movement, your basic squat movement, a basic overhead movement like a military press, and maybe a bench press in there if you want. You know, it's not going to do any harm. It's, it's probably the lower lower down on the list in terms of for aerobic athletes in ultra marathon and even triathlon, but it has its place and has its benefit. What they do particularly the squat and the deadlift, those two movement patterns in particular, is you're getting two bangs for your book. You're getting a strength-based movement, so you're moving weight that's going to physically make you stronger in terms of your legs, in terms of your physical body, because they're largely full body movements in the sense that pulling a weight and a deadlift from the ground is moving a weight from A to B and a squat, with the exception of like your pectorials and your chest, you're bracing your core and you're working through your glutes, you're working through your hamstrings, you're working through your quads, those muscle groups that you need when you're running up a hill, those muscle groups that you need when you're trying to cycle up a hill, they're the exact same muscle groups and you're building strength by doing those movement patterns in the gym and it's going to give you a little bit of kick. One of the things that back when I used to do one-to-one -one as a personal trainer, any of my marathon cli uh, clients, I used to do strength work with them and the first thing they would all notice, it's a very, very fast return on investment is when they'd go up hills on the marathons, they were flying up the hills. They would tell me that other people were struggling and they were flying up. I'm like, that's where you get this crossover benefit. So you might notice it as much on a flat, but by God, you'll notice it when you're going up a hill because you're doing, you're getting those fast twitch muscle fibers working and that's what's firing trying to get you up a hill because of the extra resistance think about a hill the reason a hill is harder is because there's more resistance because you're going in an upward motion that's all you're doing in the gym is you're recreating resistance to make yourself stronger so building a program around those movement patterns and then putting in some core work you know it's across the board Doing some form of core work in combination with that is always going to be beneficial. I've got personal preferences. As I said, I love work off a Swiss ball, body weight planks, variations on a TRX, and merging them all together. In terms of personalizing it then and finding what works best, like that really depends. You know, there's great podcasts, you know, your podcast, um, Inner Fight is one of my favorite podcasts I listen to too. Marcus Smith, who's an ultra runner there's lots of people out there putting out content that you can pull and grab you know if you go back and listen to all the 33 shake all of the podcasts that you've done warren people will be able to pull different ideas and they're like oh yeah okay i'll apply that nutritional strategy i'll apply that supplement i'll apply this training that brian mentioned or someone else mentioned and you can pool and put it together and um, to get it personalized it's always going to be better to work with a coach you know that that's generally the best and there's they're all around you know they're in gyms they're online, there's people doing it that are absolute amazing at what they do, and it's just about finding who you connect with the most. Some people work better one-to-one, -one. some people work better in small groups of endurance athletes, and some people are fine with the online capacity. It's about finding what works best for the individual if they want something that's really personalized. But the one thing I would say is don't shy away from it, because you're leaving, it's, it's just like leaving money on the table. You know, that's what I think about when I think of not doing gym work when it comes to improving your endurance performance. I'm like, yeah, you're a good ultra runner, or yeah, you're a good endurance athlete, but you could be better. You could be stronger. You could have more longevity because you don't get injured. You know, that's one of the things that I'm very fortunate with, with the exception of the Arctic, where I tore my Achilles probably more down to the cold than anything else, was... I generally don't get injured because of that conditioning. You know, I don't lose form on longer distances. That mechanics don't break down. And if you're in this game for the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years in some cases for people, it's about longevity. And if the gym-based training can give you extra longevity, 
you're going to be able to do it longer. And if you're able to do it longer, you're going to be able to get better. It's about the 33 shake and not using crappy shakes post-workout. And like, just for, I'm not sponsored. I don't do anything with, with Warren. I just love the products. That's literally how we connected. And just to give kind of full disclosure, um, checks in the post, uh, full disclosure, but the when I tell you quality ingredients, you're not going to get sick. Your immune system is going to be stronger. You're going to be able to train more. And if you can train more and you're not spending a week in bed sick, you're going to feel significantly better and be able to have a longer training period, a longer training life, a longer longevity in whatever sport you're in. So you're adding up all these small things over time as opposed to looking at them in isolated parts because people think, well, my training on the road is one thing. My gym on the road is another thing. My supplements is another thing. My food is another thing. I'm like, they're all interconnected. I'm like, they're all feeding into this one thing that you want to do. You know, your sleep, your recovery, your training, your gym, your nutrition, your supplements, all map to the end goal. And if you get that all right, you're going to have longevity in what you're doing. And the more longevity you have, the better athlete you're going to become. And then all you do is just rinse and repeat that over and over and over again until you find what works for you. That's brilliant. Uh, that, I think that puts it in such, such great context that it is a holistic approach. There's no... There's no one piece of magic that is going to suddenly turbocharge your performance. It's the showing up every day. It's the compound interest. It's the repeating the work. But it's having the intention, the focus, the goal. But it's also about being thoughtful. If you can cross-pollinate all of these areas, work on yourself as a whole, then no one thing is going to transform you. But when you start compounding them together and you make the better choice every time, then the curve only goes up. And where that takes you in six months, one year, two years, 10 years, transformative. Now, where I think the strength plays in so well in two places. One, I love the idea it's money left on the table. Like if you're not doing this, you're missing out. Um, but the second one, longevity. Longevity means also sustained performance, reduced injury, that plays into happiness and satisfaction, which is a key part of goal achievement, which is a key part of endurance sport, which is a key part. You don't do this unless you enjoy it. I agree there are pain. You know, the hurt locker is a, is a common place. A lot of suffering is not optional. You know, it's a part of it, but how much suffering do you really want? There's the suffering that is just a horrible event all day, and there's the suffering where there were some bits that were so horrible you had to go beyond yourself but the overall experience is transformative and enjoyable. Strength, excuse me, strength can really help you develop that. I, I love the way you fleshed all that out. So just to finish up on, um, okay, I want this gain that I've left on the table. I want the cash I've left on the table. I want the strength. Um, I've already got some endurance space. Is this a session or no? Is this work that people need to add onto their existing workload? Or is there an argument that says, well, you could just drop a session and swap it for one of these? How much strength work do people need to be bringing in and how should it balance with the rest of their training in order to start moving in that direction and see what that gain feels like for them? I think it depends on the time of the year and the actual training cycle that you're in. You know, I'm a big believer in kind of the old school strength and conditioning philosophy of you do the majority of the work in your off season to build it. And then all you do is maintain it during race season. And I think that, that approach tends to work for a lot of people, which basically means that if you do most of your races in the summer, you're going to be spending more time in the gym in the off season and doing more of that strength work, more of that core work and some maintenance, say run work in the off season. And then when it comes into race season, you just flip that. So for example, let's say you're doing a five day split, you're training five days a week, just keeping it super Super simple and straightforward. Monday to Friday. Let's just say that's your split. You know, or Monday to Thursday and a long day on Saturday. And that's your training split. In the winter, it might look like, you know, you've got two endurance days where you're running or you're cycling or you're combining the two, you're doing a brick session. And then you might have three gym based days where you're doing mostly strength work, mostly core work, maybe a five kilometer run at the end, or just something that kind of makes you feel mentally good at the end of the session. And then when race season comes in, you're flipping that you're going to be doing way more work that's specific to the sport so if it's triathlon you're doing a combination of the three if it's ultra endurance if it's ultra marathons you're doing running if it's half marathons you're doing running if it's cycling you're obviously doing cycling and you might do say two maintenance workouts in the gym and you're just flipping it based on again it comes back to the pyramid of prioritization in race season 
the most important thing is to peak and be ready for the races. In the off season, probably I would argue the opposite side. The most important thing is where can I build to make myself physically stronger so that I don't break down when race season comes around and then I can improve my performance when race season comes around. So it's the priority changes. Your priority as an athlete should never be the same year round. If it is, you're not going to have a long time as an athlete. You know, the top athletes in all the sports have training cycles. They have periodic training cycles where they are changing up and doing more gym work at certain times of the year and they're doing less at other times of the year. So as a kind of a bread and butter answer, now it varies person to person, but that is kind of a good trial and tested model where based on the time of the year you're doing more gym-based work and again play around with it you know there's no right fit for everybody where it's like okay you do two gym sessions a week you do one long run you do two sprint sessions and that's it that's what everyone should do it's like right here's the best practice let's kind of move it around and find what works Um, but that's kind of the general best practice and guidelines that I would advise people experiment with is off season now for a lot of people kind of coming into those October, November, December months it's like well now you could probably get that time and use that time to build up your confidence in the gym do your strength work do your core work build on that and then come February, March, April, when you're getting ready for race season again, you're going to be a significantly better athlete because of what you've done over the winter period. I love it. I love it. That's That periodization again, that really unlocks a huge amount. And it's one of those things that when you lay it out like that, it's so clear and simple. But when you're involved in a training program or races, it's hard. You know, People can come to the end of a season and just go, well, I'll tick over for a bit, and then they start picking up again in February once they've got a couple of race entries coming up. And that's, let's face it, that's a much better cycle if you're looking to improve than finishing your season doing nothing and and then having like six months off and coming back slower than you were when you started. So that's already ahead of the game. But to take that a step further, right, well, yeah, use this off-season to, you know, why not shake things up? I mean, there can be a point. We've got a friend staying with us at the moment. Uh, he's done a huge triathlon season. And um, he said, I'm, I'm ready to stop for a bit now. You know, even if you love something, you need a little break every now and again. So yeah. why not use this time to explore some weights, explore some gym, go and try some online programs, go and try something with a personal trainer, just go and find what fits. You know, you could spend a month or two just doing some different stuff. And that's not going to do you any harm either, but it's going to inform you how that strength can then be worked into your performance. And you're going to see the results off the back end of next season. Brian, I I can't thank you enough. You've absolutely, you've uh, you've dropped some great pearls of wisdom, some seriously actionable advice. You've totally over-delivered. Thank (laughs) you so much um, for, for the time and for the input. It's been awesome. The pleasure is all mine, Warren. Again, as I said, thank you so much for having me on. And everyone listening, thanks so much for listening. (laughs) Well, look, we look forward to getting you back another time. Um, If people want to get hold of you, Brian, where can they find you? Where's the best places for them to go check you out and find more? Uh, Probably Instagram, Brian underscore Keen underscore fitness and Instagram or my podcast, the Brian Keen podcast. They're kind of like my two babies at the minute. So uh, either one of those. Nice. All right. Well, we'll make sure the links, uh, links to those will be in the show notes as well. So, You don't even have to remember it if you're that lazy. You can just look down and click. Um, So look, (laughs) Brian, big thanks. I'm so glad we got to make this happen. Let's not leave it another two years before the next one. A hundred percent. Thanks so much again. So there we have it. Brian Keane. Hope you guys enjoyed that one as much as I did. I thought Brian just absolutely smashed it. Uh, He brought the knowledge. He brought the passion. He brought the enthusiasm. And he unpicked the whole thing and put it in context as to why you should be interested in bringing strength work into your endurance and aerobic performance. I know I'll certainly be uh, doing a little more weight work, uh, a little more body weight work, certainly during the off season. I thought that point about combining uh, you know, your timing so that in the off season, maybe you do do more of this strength work. And then in the race season, you transition to more uh, of your sport specific work. I, I really enjoyed that. And I think that's something that can really um, fire, enthusiasm, and excitement to keep your training fresh and varied, keep the goals motivated, and keep the back end of the year shaken up in training when it can be all too easy. The nights are getting darker, the weather's getting a bit chillier. It can be too easy to start thinking, we go into a bit of a cocoon hibernation mode, and then it gets a lot harder to kick off in January. So I say, hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I did. Um, And if you get hungry at any point, if you need the very best 
in natural sports nutrition, then you know exactly where to find it. If you don't, it's at 33fuel.com. Uh, thanks for listening. Look forward to catching you on the next podcast. And as well as that, don't forget, if you want to check out all of Brian's work, then the links that he mentioned for his Instagram uh, and for his podcast, you will find those in the show notes below.